the time, just in the chat, uh, just, get, just give it up for our amazing leader and his wife. I'm excited. Hey, well, we're going to go to this book uh, called The Bible. And we go to this book because what I find is when I talk to my friends, they're real cool, um, and they give me great advice based off of experiences, right? Like, they're like, hey, um, don't go to that restaurant, go to that restaurant. Don't buy that car, buy that car. You know what? Don't date, don't date her. Like, you're supposed to date her. Like, they give me great advice based off experience. The difference is when I get with friends, and we're going to talk about this later, uh, that are godly, uh, they give me advice based off of this thing that's been changing life for literally thousands of years. And I think that if you lean in a little bit today, Everything that I say, like, it might come off a little too hype or a little bit too somber, depending on the mood. Um, but this word actually has been changing lives. And if you lean in, I think God might want to say something about you right in the middle of your situation right now where you are. So without further ado, let me just let the Holy Spirit do his thing. Let's go to Mark 5. We're going to go to Mark 5, chapter 1. Mark 5, chapter 1. It says in verse 1, they went across the lake to the region of the Gerasenes. When Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an evil spirit came from the tombs to meet him. This man lived in the tombs, and no one could bind him any more, not even with a chain. For he had often been chained hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. He shouted at the top of his voice, what do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? Swear to God that you won't torture me. For Jesus said to him, come out of this man, you evil spirit. Then Jesus asked him, what is your name? And he said, my name is Legion. Like I feel like, was, you know, this demon's talking. You know, he got weird, weird voices. Anyway, I just figured I'd throw a voice there. My name is Legion, for we are many, right? Like, this is what he said. Uh, and he begged Jesus again and again not to send them out of the area. A large herd of pigs was feeding on the nearby hillside. The demons begged Jesus, send us among the pigs. Allow us to go into them. He gave them permission, and the evil spirits came out and went into the pigs. The herd, about 2,000 in number, rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. I wonder if sometimes we fight against things that if we just gave them to God, they're actually ready to kill themselves. How crazy is that? That's a whole nother sermon I don't have time for. 14, those tending the pigs ran off and reported this in the town and countryside, and the people went out to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus, they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons sitting there dressed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Those who had seen it told the people what had happened to the demon-possessed man and told about the pigs as well. Then the people began to plead with Jesus to leave their region. As Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. Jesus did not let him, but said, go home to your family and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. So the man went away and began to tell the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him and all the people were Amazed. Today, we're going to talk from a simple title, A Recipe for Rising Up. You can write it down, A Recipe for Rising Up. But first, let me pray. Lord God, I thank you so much for what you have to say. I pray, God, that every single word that my flesh, that my humanity has might fall to the floor and be void, God. But your word, which remains true, your word, uh, which does not return void, that it might spark right now, that it might ignite in somebody's spirit exactly what you would have for them. Only what you would have for them, God. Touch parts of them, God, that only you can touch. See into places that only you can see and speak to what only you can speak to. I thank you, God, for moving me out the way and saying what you have to say. In Jesus' name I pray. Somebody say it. Amen. Amen. That's an old church. If you've been in church for like, you know, a week or less, you're like, what does it mean when somebody said? Everybody just say amen. It's a thing. So anyways, uh, I'm going to do it again just in case your first time. Somebody say it. Amen. See, now you know. How cool is that? All right. Um, I hate chain letters. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Just, I know that's a rough introduction. I hate chain letters. Um, and y'all like, what are chain letters? Like chain mail, okay? Mail, okay. Uh, if you're under the age of like 32, we used to have this thing we called mail, okay? Um, if you're under the age of 18, we used to have this stuff called paper. Uh, <laughs> and, we, and, and it was our main mode uh, of communication. Uh, we, <laughs> we would write stuff on it, you know, like, I don't know, recipes and, and words. It was crazy. Uh, we wouldn't use our thumbs. We had to use our whole hand, and they would teach us how to write it in circles. And you got extra points for that. Anyways, um, 
But we would get these things in the mail, so we'd send people letters. And every once in a while, you get a letter that would say something like, hey, if you really are a blessed man of God, get this and then send it to five more people. It's a chain. And, I, I, and that's amazing. I, I love that. And it was great. And now we actually still have them. So if you're under the age of 18, you may have seen this on Facebook. Like, hey, if you really want to end, like, this specific thing, then you know what? Take this and send it to six more people. Let them know you love them. And then it's like, oh, okay, this is, this is pressure for me. I, don't, I, didn't, I came on here to look at photos. Like, I didn't, I didn't come on here for the pressure. Um, and here's the issue is that I would get these things that even on Instagram now, I'd be like, hey, if you really are a man of God, then you will take this, screenshot it. <laughs> it's like what we're doing in 2021. You screenshot it, send it to 12 more people, and then they'll know they're blessed. Amen. Like, it's, and it's a lot of pressure. And I'm like, I just, I really just came for the photos. I didn't come for the pressure. Um, and I'm also a procrastinator. So here's the issue. If you ever sent me a chain mail or a chain post on Facebook, I'm just going to let you know I broke the chain. Okay, I'm just going to let you know, like, I am the weakest link. Goodbye. Like, I'm so sorry. I apologize. I just don't, I just don't like chain letters. I don't like chain mail. It's too much pressure, and I'm a procrastinator, and it's not good. And here's the thing. That can be kind of funny if we're thinking about chain mail. We're talking about chain letters, maybe the U.S. Postal Service. Um, but the issue is that some of us have been like me, and we've actually broken uh, some chains in our lives. And, 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 and like this man, we find ourselves having broken chains, and yet we're still wearing the shackles. And as I was thinking about some of the places in my life that I've been chained, you know, my dad actually, uh, one of the reasons we came back to Cleveland, I was born at Case Western University, uh, but my dad actually lived right at West 28th in Detroit before it was like Detroit Shoreway, and it was all cute. Like, I don't know where you're watching this from, but like here in Cleveland, we have Detroit Shoreway, but it was Detroit side projects uh, back in the day. Uh, and he lived there, and um, he had to break some chains. But if I'm honest, he broke some amazing chains, and I've never known a day of lack. And he bought his mom a house, and he did all these amazing things. But if I'm being honest, the truth is I'm still holding on to some of the shackles um, that he broke so long ago. And, and if we're not careful, we can get real uh, churchy, and we can get real educated, and we can get real biblical, and uh, we can say God is a chain breaker, and he's a way maker, and absolutely yes, but sometimes we'll find ourselves coming out of a tomb still holding on shackles. We've been talking recently about this recipe for rising up, this recipe for moving from where I am to where God wants me to be. And so many of us are trying to rise up, but every once in a while, as we're running full speed towards entrepreneurship, full speed towards a new relationship, full speed towards a new house, we'll hear the slightest jingle of change that we swore we broke back there. And I just want to talk because I think this young, this, this young man, this man who's coming out of a tomb might just give us a recipe for rising up. There's a couple questions. I think that we, if we ask ourselves these, that we might just maybe not just break chains, but be loosed of some shackles. The first question this man asked him, you got to write it down. If you're not a note taker, write it down. Okay, this is a good thing you can write down. Uh, he simply asked himself this question. You should ask it to yourself. Where am I? And this is so wild because if you think about the man and where he physically was, the Gadarenes, the Gerasenes, this place back in the day, they actually recounted in a couple different gospels. That's just a couple different books in this place, this thing we call the Bible. They recounted a couple different ways, but either way, it wasn't like a bad place. Y'all think I'm lying. Check that, like, throw that first picture up. This first picture right here lets us know, like, this is the ruins. That's bigger than all my houses. Like, I ain't got but the one, but it's bigger than it. Like, this is a beautiful place. They had aqueducts. It was teeming. You can throw that second picture up. Like, check this second picture out. They had a theater. A little bigger than New Community. Like, this is a big place. Like, you could socially distance 2,000 people in here easily. Like, it was crazy. Like, this is so big. Check out this last picture. Like, this, again, is the ruins of what they had left. They had coliseums. This is actually a Gentile community, so they had built these amazing things to Zeus. This is right where that man lived. Except, um, you can roll that last picture, this is where he lived. And I think if we're honest because of some of the shackles that we currently wear, some of us find ourselves just outside of the palace. We can hear the party going on, we can hear the fun, we can hear the breakthrough, we can see that our cousin got a new car, uh, we can celebrate that person that got their stimulus check, we don't know where ours is yet. <laughs> um, 
we can celebrate all those things and we find ourselves just outside of a right relationship with God, just outside of a breakthrough, just like I, I can hear it and I can get to it, but for some reason I find myself chained, I find myself shackled, and I think that honestly we have to ask ourselves the question, where am I? This man sees perfection. In Mark 5, verses 3, it actually said this man lived in the tombs just outside of perfection. No one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. He was a chain breaker. Some of us have come in here, and we've broken generational curses. We've started to break some anxiety, break some depression, and yet he's still wearing shackles. For he had often been chained hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart, broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough, uh, no one was strong enough uh, to stop his business. No one was no, strong enough to stop his entrepreneurship. No one was strong enough to stop the fact that he was going to be better than his dad. No one was, better, uh, was, was able to stop the fact that he was going to be better than his mom, better than his grandma that he was going to make sure that there was a new way for it. Oh, you don't say that in your version. That's just my version. I'm sorry. At night and day among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. But sometimes we have to ask ourselves, where am I? And you're probably thinking, okay, Kyle, I know I'm in Cleveland, Ohio. What are you talking about? Okay, well, where am I mentally is maybe a question you should ask yourself. Where do I find myself in the midst of COVID? Uh, do I find myself constantly posting things on Facebook, knowing full and well, ain't nobody reading the comments except for me, because now I got to read them all, I got to delete them, I got to add some, I got to add, okay, what I really was trying to say is now next thing you know, you edited in the Facebook post that you made six weeks ago, just so it's good now, because, oh my gosh, I said Black Lives Matter, now I got to say anti-Asian Asian hate, like it's, all the hates are building up, Kyle, what, and you found yourself running ragged with all the things that you feel like you're supposed to be able to bring to the table. I think this man, literally who wasn't in his right mind, had to figure out, where am I mentally? Maybe you're okay mentally. Maybe you're like, Kyle, actually, I have power, love, and a sound mind. Like, you're a good God-fearing person, like Second Timothy. Like, I am good. Like, okay, great. Um, can I ask, where are you emotionally? You know, I didn't even know how angry I was. I told you my dad, love him to death, and man, he gave me this amazing face, and he gave me, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to brag, but I'll just say, uh, that's not in the notes, uh, but he gave me this amazing body, he gave me this amazing story, he gave me this amazing testimony, um, but I got really angry in 2015 when he passed away, and uh, you know, it's crazy, it's, I didn't even know how angry I was until in 2017, it was Father's Day, and my wife, amazing as she is, she's so beautiful. I, I should have had six pictures of her. She could just preach. Um, but she came to me, and she, she brought me some pictures. And she said, hey, Kyle, it's Father's Day. I wanted you to see it. And I didn't even know how angry I was. And then I, I, I flipped out. I was like, why would you show me this? I see him every day in the mirror. I wish I could not see him. Are you angry? You lose a loved one or two or three in COVID, feel like you can't trust anything that you've read anywhere, and you're looking for answers, you're searching, where am I mentally, where am I emotionally? Have you turned to vices? Are you visiting websites that nobody knows about, and at the same time, everybody realizes the shackles you have except for you? Where am I mentally? Where am I emotionally? And then finally, I think he finally got to that question. Where am I physically? You know, we talked about the snow and the importance of moving. I love the fact, I wrote it down here. Uh, here's the great thing that this man realized. He was in a tomb physically, and you can write it down in your notes this way, because I think it's a powerful note that might break a shackle, that might break a chain and give you the process of starting to break the shackles for you. Uh, he knew this thing. Where I am <laughs> doesn't determine where I'm capable of going. Somebody's got to get that truth. Like, we're not just going to be somber. Where I am doesn't determine where I'm capable of growing. I told you about a father who grew up in the west side of Detroit projects and then moved to 135th in Kinsman. But can I tell you, he said, you know what? I'm going to do something a little bit different for my son. So he decided, just like me in that snow, he was going to move it. Can I tell you, my mom is from Lee in Harvard on the, on the south, on the southern side of Cleveland, east southern side of Cleveland. But she decided, I'm going to do something a little bit different. So she moved her kids out to the 
the boonies and Warren, and they probably were like, I don't know anything out here. The same way when that man was running full speed to Jesus saying, I don't know anybody out here, but I know I got to get out of this situation because where I'm from doesn't determine what, where I am capable of going. I mean, my grandmother, a, a, a young woman from Tuskegee, Alabama, had a, a ticket pinned on her chest, and I'm sure she was scared when she was in that cattle car, and they were saying, hey, you got to move from the south and go to the north because it's not safe for you to be down here. And I just imagine her at nine years old, 10 years old, in that space trying to figure out what she was supposed to do, but I think in that moment she knew the same thing that I knew. She knew the same thing this man with shackles knew, that where I am will not determine where I am capable of going. And I want to remind somebody of that today, that your purpose has not been denied because of COVID, that your purpose has not been denied of because of a pandemic. Your purpose is still your purpose. Your potential is still there. And where you are doesn't determine where you're going. But you first are going to have to determine And maybe when you determine that, you'll find that you need to do the same thing that this man did. You got to get help. Mentally, emotionally, physically, you, you got to get help. I'm glad to be here at New Community with so many people that are interested. It's amazing. Uh, we don't talk about statistics all the time. Um, you know, we talk about keeping the lights on and stuff. That's important. But we talk about people. <laughs> when I'm in meetings, we often talk about stories. We often will spend hours talking about a single story, a single person. How are we meeting that need? How are we not meeting that need? And I love the fact that this man realizes he has to get help. Can I just tell you one way that you might want to get help now? You might have to get some godly friends. And this is a big deal, right? Because this man is stuck in a tomb. And I told you that they actually talk about this in multiple gospels. So they talk about not just in Mark, what we just read, but they talk about it also in Matthew. Uh, and they also talk about it in Luke. And can I tell you, in Matthew, it's really interesting because he's not alone in Matthew. Now, this is deep. You're like, how are we talking? About? No, no, no. So in the same exact story, Matthew tells it. And when Matthew tells it, he tells it from a different. You don't believe me. Put the verse up. Okay, they don't believe me. That's fine. Matthew 8, 28 through 29. It says, when he arrived at the other side in the region of the Gadarenes, that's Jesus, two, <laughs> two demon-possessed men. You know what that tells me? Two demon-possessed men coming from the tombs met Jesus in his gospel. You know what that tells me is just because somebody's standing with me doesn't mean that they're walking with me. And I think sometimes we can say, this has been my friend for 15 years. This has been my business partner for 15 years. This is the person I ride for, I die for, bad boys for life. Like this, we do all these amazing things, but can I tell you, it doesn't mean that they're walking the same direction. There was two men in a tomb. They looked to their left and their right, and neither one of them had an answer. You know, I used to speak about this message, and I would say, man, um, are you alive right now? And he'd be like, okay, Kyle, I'm breathing. Duh, I'm watching you. Okay, I get it. Um, are the people you would spiritually alive? Are they spiritually awake? Are they spiritually aware? Are they giving you advice best off of, their experiences are based off of eternity. Are you spiritually alive? You got to get some godly friends. You know, one of the things I love so much about New Community is that we have these amazing things called life groups. And I'm telling you, even though we're almost darn near done with the season, you could jump into a life group right now. And I have to go to life groups consistently because I forget who I'm actually supposed to be in Christ all the time. Like I told y'all, I am not healed. I just know where the medicine is. And one of the medicines that we take all the time here is we go to life groups and we get people that have godly advice. We get people that aren't just basing what they know based off of their expectations or how much, how cute he is or how much money they make. Like, no, we get people who are actually in godly community that are walking in a direction that we know is uplifting not just themselves, but ourselves and us as a unit towards God. I love this community so much. If you're not connected, if you're not in a life group, if you find yourself in a tomb, you might have to run and get help. You know, I say this all the time at Elevate. I said it earlier today, and I'm, I'm just going to let you write it down because you probably haven't taken it as a note because it wasn't written down, right? So we're going to write this down. Uh, but you could just say, my friends, give me advice based off of experience, but 
my godly friends give me advice based on eternity. And I'm telling you, I love, I, I, I understand the importance of friends and drinking buddies and hanging out and, oh, these are just my coworkers and, oh, these are just people I chat with online and these are the people I game with, bro. Like, I understand that, but can I tell you, those people that have given me some of the best advice are the ones that remind me of who I am. Speaking of remind me of who I am, I believe James actually talks about this, and I think it's so important. We can reference it here. James 1, 23 through 25, it says, anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard but doing it, they will be blessed and what they do. Now, I really want to live in verse 25, but the truth is I'm really in verse 24 most of the time. Like, I really want to, like, look into the perfect law of God and know exactly what he has for me. But I can tell you my biblical friends, these are the people that will let you know before you send the text message, before you send the DM, before you respond to that, before you have a phone call, before you put that Facebook post up, they let me know, like, hey, Kyle, I understand you want to put the Facebook post up and it's a little abrasive, so you should understand that, like, man doesn't live by Facebook posts alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. Like, uh, these are the people that, like, whenever I'm like, oh, I can't believe how their kids is acting, then I look at the side at Nico, and they're like, judge not, lest you be judged. Like, those are, the, those are the people that, like, have to really speak truth into my life at those pinnacle times, at those pivotal times when I want to go into a dark place, and I said, you know what? I'm thinking about just ending it all, and I don't even know if life is worth it. They remind me of a story of Elijah calling down fire, and then just a moment later having to be fed by ravens because he was about to hurt himself, and he was about to kill himself, too. They remember that even the most prominent people can still have problems. Like, I'm telling you, you got to get you some good godly friends that remind you who you are. You are Christ's beloved. You are a royal priesthood. You are a holy nation. You are worth more than you ever thought. He says he can do exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ask or think according to his power that works in us. That means that you are exceeding. You are abundant. You are above what you could even ask or think. That business that you have, he has something better for you. The relationship that's broken, he has something better for you. Can I tell you I got to get me some godly friends in my life every once in a while? Every once in a while. And this man realizes he doesn't have it. And I wonder why he doesn't have it. Well, we know why he doesn't have it, because maybe the people that were supposed to lift him up are the same very people that chained him. <sighs> that wasn't in the notes. Just write it down. Maybe the same people that were supposed to lift him up were the certain people that chained him. And somebody right now is like, oh, this is real cute. He hooping and hollering from stage. Heard that before. Let me move on. Um, can I pause you for a second and say, if you've been hurt before, by all of these, I'm going to say an H word in church, uh, humans. Pastor Kevin got scared for a second. Uh, <laughs> if you've been hurt before by all these humans, can I tell you that, that you're not the only one? Can I, can I tell you if you're walking around with that anger, and the truth is you're walking around with anger because somebody you trusted hurt you. Somebody that you told that secret to, and you, they weren't supposed to tell anybody else. They was going to be your accountability partner, and next thing you know, it was on an email thread, and, and you're hearing about it, and you're, you're walking, and what? I'm supposed to come back there? I'm, I'm, supposed to, I'm supposed to sign up for Easter with people like that? That's the reason I have shackles on. Can I just, I, I want to give you this tip, and it, and it helped me, because um, it talks about, the, the Bible talks about forgiving um, and forgetting, and I know we say, I forgive, but I never forget, and I get it, I understand, we're, we're good church people, that's what we do, um, but it's empowering what it says in Philippians 3, verse 13, and I just want to hammer this point home, it says, brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself Yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I, ooh, there's that F word. One thing I do. 
And now he's talking about the things that he's messed up. He's talking about the things that he hasn't done right. He's talking about the text message that he sent. Because I know we don't talk about the things that we did to start the fight. But he's talking about the things that, that, that he actually knows he can't quite own up to. But he says, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead. I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me. I think some of us lose our prize because what somebody else did. Prize for which God has called me. Heavenward in Christ Jesus. There was a series of um, commercials last, uh, maybe a couple years ago. It was like pizza commercials. It was based out of New Jersey. So it was like a really weird um, word that they made up. But it was like, forget about it. It was like way too, you know, it was very Italian, very Jersey. I, I'm not from Italy or New Jersey. Uh, so I can say it right, but can I tell you, maybe one of the strongest things you could ever do, and it's going to take you a while to spell this note, forget about it. And somebody's like, I can't forget how they hurt me. Okay, well, just start with forgiveness. Just start there and see what the Holy Spirit does. Just start with saying, you know what, I know it was your fault, but I still love you. I could tell you there's a couple times in my life where I've been hurting so deep. I didn't think I was ever going to move past. And then I remembered, actually, my job is to get to my prize. And if I denigrate, disrespect, and walk away from the entire church because of what somebody else did, I might lose my prize. And I love you, but it's kind of like when I'd be going to basketball practice and people would be hanging out, they, some of them getting high and doing this and doing that. I was like, Oh, too bad for you. I'm probably going to take your spot because I have a prize that I have to get to. And I don't know, maybe you've been hurt before, but can I just tell you, you have a prize that you have to get to. And it might mean that you have to trust another life group. And the, and I, I, the Bible doesn't say this, but my first grade teacher did. Uh, she said, if at first you don't succeed, try, try again. So that's at least three times. So just try three life groups, okay? If you tried the first one and they tried you, and like, okay, that's Lee, but like try a second one, try a third one. Your prize is too important. What God has for you is too important. And people are waiting on you to get to your prize. We're not going to talk about it, but this man goes back to the Decapolis. That's 10 cities that surround where he was chained up. This man goes and reaches 10 cities for God. Somebody was waiting on him to run full speed in his race. Somebody's waiting on me. Somebody's waiting on you on the other side of this camera. Cooking eggs, got coffee. If you're in a checkout line right now, just checking this out. Like, I'm telling you, somebody is waiting on you. Those kids are waiting on you. New community, our next gen is waiting on you. The next generation needs to know what you've gone through so that we can make sure we step to the left when that pothole comes up. Okay, I'm preaching too long. Where am I? Where am I? Where am I? Then I got to get some help. I got to get some godly friends. You're going to have to get some help, but you're going to have to first know where you are, where am I, get some help. But here's the most important one, and we could do all those other amazing things and I don't know, they might have like the worship team or keyboarders or something come behind me and play because that lets me know that I have to stop talking. Um, but where am I? I have to get help. And then I got to get to Jesus. I have 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 to get to Jesus. I wonder if that's what the man was saying while he was running full speed. Verses 6 and 7. I read all 20 for context, but it says when he saw Jesus from a distance. When he saw Jesus from a distance. So powerful because it actually, if you look at the history, it says that this Jesus was probably five miles off. So I think maybe before he even saw him, he just like heard of him and he's like, maybe I'll get a little bit closer. And then he finally pushed through and he, and he said, oh, I got to run full speed now. Like, I can't miss this moment. And somebody right now, wherever you are, you can't miss this moment. You've got to get to Jesus. In verse uh, 6, it says, when he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran 
and fell on his knees in front of him. And actually, let me go back because I want to look at verse 7. Verse 7 is powerful. This is where we like to stay as a church. In verse 7, it says, he shot it. Look at them. Oh, Cheryl is crushing it downstairs. Y'all don't even know that, but she is. Anyways, uh, verse 7. Uh, in verse 7, I'm going to read it from here because Cheryl got it. He shouted at the top of his voice, what do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high God, in God's name, don't torture me. Can I tell you that a lot of us get to verse 7 real quick. Jesus, what do you want from me? I'll give you my life. Jesus, I'll do everything. Jesus, what do you have for me? Is it a new job? That would be great. Uh, is it a new spouse? Okay, maybe that would be, like, that'd be horrible. But you were like, that would be great. Is it a new relationship? Is it a new purpose? Like, what do you, Jesus, what do you have for me? I only lift my voice towards you. What can I do? And we get to verse 7 real easy, and we forget about verse 6. You know, I said it one time. I was ministering for this amazing ministry we here we have called Elevate. I should have said it earlier, but it's our 18 to 30-year-old ministry. Um, if you're 32, it's online, so you can still come. Don't worry about it. Uh, we're not checking IDs. Um, but I said something in there. I said, sometimes I feel like I'll run full speed towards the promises of God, and I'll just forget about the person of God. Jesus, what do you want from me? But the posture, the posture, not the potential, the posture, not the purpose, the posture is what got rewarded. In verse 6, it says, when he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. When's the last time you ran and fell on your knees in front of God? I heard so many people like, oh, I can't wait till church gets opened up so I can worship again. Ooh. There's something amazing about being around a body of believers, but there's something amazing about believing just in your body. And this man believed in his body. This man ran full speed. And I'm not here just to give you some cool, pithy statement. But actually, actually, I believe his posture is what was rewarded. And I was reading through this, and, and, and I'm closing here, because as I saw this man that ran full speed towards Jesus, if I can be very honest, <laughs> I was reading this like October 2018, 2019, 2019, and I really felt like God was like, I got something else for you, and I was like, ah, but I'm stuck here, because honestly, I looked at it, and I said, God, um, I said, why was this man worth stopping for? And I'm not like a mean person, but in just a moment, and I heard we're going to have some amazing teaching on this coming up soon, so I won't spoil it. But in just a moment, there, there's a priest, there, there's, there's Jairus, uh, and he actually is going to have his daughter healed. She's a young 12-year-old girl that ends up, like, coming to life. Like, okay, I'm a dad. That, that makes sense. She's a 12-year-old. Who doesn't want a middle schooler to get their life right with Christ? Like, absolutely. There's a woman that has an issue of blood, and she's had an issue for 12 years. As long as the girl has been alive, she's had an issue. There's a woman, and she literally gets trampled, and, uh, and she has to climb through dirt and, and, and smelly feet to get to the hem of a garment and get a blessing. And, okay, Jesus, that, that, that makes sense. The girl, the woman, and a demon-possessed man from a tomb, like, and then I... I read the verse a little differently. If we can go back to chapter 5, and I know Cheryl is like scrolling. She's like, this is not in the notes, Kyle. What are you doing? Okay, but if we can go back to chapter 5, at the beginning of verse 2, verse 2, it says, when Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an evil spirit came from a tomb. To when Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an evil spirit came from the tombs. A man came from a tomb. A man. A man came from a tomb. A man. A man came from a tomb. A man. A man was running full speed out of a tomb. 
a man who was cast out by his friends and his family and villagers and all the people that he was supposed to trust, the very most, the same people that said Hosanna, they, they threw him in a tomb. A man then came running full speed out of a tomb. And, and I said, oh, he said, Kyle, I had a deja vu moment. I, I can't think of a better English way of putting it. I saw this man running from a tomb. And I saw that he had broken these chains. And honestly, I was just, I had to stop because he was still wearing those daggone shackles. And I said, the only difference between what he's doing right now and what I'm going to do in just a moment on the day of Pentecost is that when I come out of that tomb, I'm not wearing shackles. I'm, I'm actually going to go to hell. I'm going to take the keys of death, hell, and the grave for every shackle that you might still be wearing. Yes, you've broken chains. You've broken generational curses. But only God has the sovereignty to support your shackles coming off. And he said, Kyle, I need you to tell somebody today. That the reason you got to know where you are, the reason you got to get help, the reason you got to get to Jesus isn't to break the chain, it's to release the shackle. I don't think God wants us living anymore in 90% freedom. I don't think God anymore wants you living in 90% freedom. And some of us, I know we're quarantined at home and we feel like we're in a tomb. We feel like we're right outside of where we need to be can't actually enjoy the nice weather. We can't enjoy our neighbors. But can I tell you, even in that moment, I think God might want to break a shackle off of you. And I just want to pray for somebody today. Maybe you're not in a physical tomb. Maybe it's an emotional tomb. Maybe it's a mental tomb. Maybe it's a spiritual tomb. You've gone through 365 days of craziness, nonsense. You're trying to raise those kids, and you're trying to raise them to be godly, and you need somebody in your life, and you forgot to sign up for life groups, and now you don't even know how to get connected again. Somebody's wearing a shackle. And I just want to pray for you right where you are, because what we know is that, yes, our God is a chain breaker, but he also knows how to take the key and take off the shackles. So right here, wherever you are, I'm just going to ask you with your head bowed, with your eyes closed. I just want to pray for somebody that's ready to break a shackle. So I'm just going to pray for you right now. If this prayer is for you, if you're in the middle uh, of Heinen's, if you're in the middle of Dave's, I'm just going to ask you to do something so bold as to simply put your hand up and put it right back down and you listen to this with AirPods in and people will think you're crazy for five seconds, but I'm telling you, when you make that significant decision on the outside, I believe it changes everything on the inside. So if that's you, I'm just going to ask you to put your hand up, put your hand up, put your hand up. Right now, God, I just say I'm praying. I'm praying, God, for somebody who's carrying a shackle into 2021, for somebody who's been carrying a shackle in 2020, for somebody who's been carrying a shackle through 2017, for somebody who lost a loved one. Everybody's saying COVID-19 has been good for them. Somebody COVID-19 took everything. God, and I just pray right now that you might break the chain. Yes, God, but you might also remove a shackle that they'll know that they can live in complete freedom, that they can know they can live in complete hope, that they can know they can live in complete perseverance, God. They're running right now to your feet. They're running right now, God. They're running right now, God. They're right now in their living room, and they're putting their kids down, and they're saying, I need to get to a point where all that matters is getting to Jesus. They're here now. I pray, God, that you might, with those keys that you stole from death, help me. I shouldn't even say you stole and you walked in, God, like you owned them in the first place. That you might insert them into a shackle that they thought would never come off. God, and that they might actually see their wrists again. They might see the thing that was supposed to move left and right, that was supposed to hold the hands that were going to serve you in a way that only you can. Lord, I, I just want to pray for one more person right now in this moment. Because the truth is, is somebody just had a shackle removed, but maybe more importantly, somebody doesn't even know that they're chained. It said in the verse that there were two men there. I think at some point they were there and they thought that was it. 
somebody right now is even thinking of maybe contemplating suicide and, and taking their life and you're about to make a permanent decision for a temporary problem. I'm just leaning into somebody right now that says, yes, uh, yeah, shackles is real cute and knowing where I am and that's a real cool suit you got on, Kyle, but I'm in the midst of pain and, and I don't know a way out. I want to tell you that this man who heard about Jesus the same way that you're hearing about Jesus today, you can also run and fall full speed at the foot of a father and say, Jesus, help me. And if you want to start that relationship for the first time today, I, I, I have to give you the opportunity to do so. It's changed my life forever from when I was young to when I'm old. And I'm telling you, it will change yours right now in that place if you give your life to him. So right now, I'm going to ask that same thing. And I'm just going to count. I'm just going to count to three because I think that right now it's stirring in your spirit. And I want to give you a moment to consecrate the fact that I am giving away everything to get something that I could not gain with everything. So I'm just going to say one. God loves you too. I believe that you will never be the same again. Raise your hand if that's for you. One, two, three. I believe the hands are going up online. I believe the hands are going up in grocery stores. I believe the hands are going up in living rooms. Hands are going up at works, uh, places of work. Hands are going up in the car. Hands, hands, hands right now. If that's you, I want you to simply repeat this prayer after me. Say, Jesus, I believe that you lived. I believe that you died for my sins. My shame, my separation from you, every wrong decision. But I believe that you walked out of a tomb and rose for my salvation. Today, God, I give you my life. And I know that everything won't be perfect, but I'm chasing today after perfection. In Jesus' name, I pray. I believe I'm saved. Amen, amen, amen. Hey, can we go wild and crazy? The Bible says all of heaven is going wild and crazy, so we're going to outshout these keys. God is doing a new thing. Look, we say this all the time at Elevate. We say in John 12, 32, we come together for one reason, one reason only. God says, if I be lifted up, then I'll draw all men unto, the me, unto me. So what you just heard is us not elevating our circumstances or elevating our priorities, but we're elevating the name of God. Hey, I love you guys so much. Come on. Recipe. It's just a recipe. It's just a recipe. It's just a recipe.